Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Quiet Light Podcast. This is Pat Yates sitting in for Joe Valley. Today, I have David Perry with Get Caro, and this is going to be a fascinating conversation. If you're trying to find ways for your products to be distributed uh, on different stores and through other people that that can can go out and push traffic and and sell through their site, and you get orders in a sort of a passive way, this is an amazing system because it helps you match up with people. So. David Perry is really an amazing entrepreneur. He's been in the video game industry for over 30 years for a lot of games. Uh, he's Atari and Sony have bought his companies, which are obviously really good ones. I remember days of playing Atari. You got to be old enough to remember Atari. I'm not even aging myself on that one. Um, anyway, his new new company has investors like PayPal build, building collaborative commerce. They help brands increase awareness, sales, and raise investment and get acquired or go public. They have over 28,000 brands installed and they have influencer celebrities as brands as well. This is going to be really exciting because I think that the more that you look at this, the more ideas you'll get of people that you could go out and be able to have them list your products on their sites and help you increase your traffic and sales. So we're going to get right to it here with David Perry. It should be a fun conversation. Hey, David, it's great to have you on the Quiet Light Podcast today. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely, man. I'm so fascinated to talk about this. You know, it's really interesting because when I rewind my history, You know, I I did um, a license oddly with Snooki back in 2008, sort of by accident, sort of in a social situation with my company that I own. And ever since then, I've sort of been fascinated with influencers and how, you know, you find them, who are the best ones. And you sort of created a unique way to be able to, to, to look at this and take your brand and kind of take it forward. So I'm excited to talk about this today, but maybe... The best thing you can do on is to tell us a little bit about Get Caro and what your business is overall, just as an overview from a 30,000 foot view. Yeah, well, I might say originally from the video game industry. And so to me, to what the heck am I doing in e-commerce? And the answer is because we saw a pretty big opportunity and video games are big, you know, multi-billion dollars, but, um, you know, e-commerce is in the trillion of do- trillions of dollars. So we thought this would be interesting to see if we could do anything to help. And we simply looked at retail and said, well, how does it work for retail? If I make a protein bar and I get that protein bar into Whole Foods, I'm so excited because I'm getting to enjoy the uh, Whole Foods audience. If we then got it into Costco and Walmart and Target, we'd literally be hugging each other because we, you know, we've succeeded. Um, and, And so then we thought, well, who's doing that for you online? Like who's helping you get your products into as many online stores as possible? Because that seems to be one of the core problems with e-commerce is getting attention. You know, there's these platforms, Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, they all do the same thing. They help you build an island and then it's up to you to get the internet to visit your island. And that's actually kind of hard. And, and there's a lot of people, as you know, can you can actually build a store and have zero traffic. Um, and there's a lot of people die trying to get the attention to their store. So the thought was, is there any way we could possibly help with this? Because there's not a single brand on planet Earth that doesn't want more attention every day. Like, have you ever met a brand that's like, please, no more attention? It doesn't happen. And so I thought was, what can we do to help? Um, you know, can we get brands to collaborate with each other in some way? So um, the first brand we reached out to was a, a bicycle brand that didn't sell helmets. And we said to them, you know, like, this is kind of weird. You're not selling helmets. And they said, we don't make helmets. We make the bikes. And and we're like, but that that's not a good answer because they're going to go to Amazon and buy the helmet. And if you were just to include the helmets in your store, your, your average order value, we are certain will increase. And your lifetime value of your customers, which unlocks your marketing, which lets you bring more people to your island. And so they tried it. And of course, their their AOV went up. And then they came back to us saying, do you have gloves by any chance? Do you have bike locks? And do you have all this other stuff? So what we effectively do is we take any amount of suppliers that you want to work with, and we wire them directly into your store. So instead of you trying to guess which colors and sizes of helmets and buying pallets of them and storing them in your warehouse, instead, we just give you their entire inventory. Um, it's a bit like dating. If they say, yes, they want to work with you, then you get their entire inventory available to you and you can just um, merchandise those products as you like. But that means you have all the colors and all the sizes and you can actually work out what your audience wants versus you trying to guess um, what sizes you should be stocking. So hopefully that right. makes sense. 
Well, that kind of makes sense. It's it's really interesting because in the past, you know, when I sort of looked at licensing and I sort of run that over to influencers, I always try to do, you know, create things around them that they could be passionate about. But sometimes it's about adding other products, you know, and being able to have a wider scope that might help sell too. So I tell you what, let's start from maybe the creator side. So let's just assume that someone out there is a pseudo influencer. Maybe they're small. They want to make a, a few hundred bucks a month if they can, but they want to, they, maybe they have a lot of people that follow them. Tell us about your pitch. If you were talking to a creator, how you can increase their quote unquote brand or their, their ability to distribute products. And how can you add value to that creator within your company? Well, let's say uh, Pat's the creator. Uh, we simply say, um, you know, today, it's kind of it's kind of funny. Do you have any deals right now? And they commonly go, yeah, I've got this T-shirt deal. And then we go, do you own the customers? And they're like, no. Um, and it turns out that very commonly, a lot of influencers today have some kind of deals where someone else is always keeping their customers or they have affiliate deals where they're sending their clicks somewhere else. So they're finding the customer. They're convincing the customer that they want to buy this thing, and then they're just handing them off to Amazon, for example. Amazon pays around 3 to 5% affiliate fee, depending on the category that you send them, and they keep the customer. So then you go, well, hold on a minute. Is that a good idea not to own any customers? Because some influencers have been doing this for like 10 years now, and they still don't own any customers. Why? Because they're focused on followers. So what's more valuable, followers or customers? And uh, in reality, all the really, really wealthy um, influencers now have customers and are going after customers all day, every day. And they're building their own enterprise brand. And so you have to, in a way, imagine um, um, TikTok was to go away, for example. Just imagine that happened or, or Instagram um, disappeared because it's happened in the past. I remember sitting in the MySpace offices. They were the most cocky people ever because they were killing it. And now they're gone, right? So imagine your your followers were all and, and potential customers were locked in the platform. It's pretty great if you can work out of all your followers who actually takes your advice to buy, get them in your own store, and then you can remarket to them and have a real relationship with those people. So, so that would be number one is it's very important that you start to build a customer um, uh, database effectively. And and um, it's interesting, I would say less than 1% of influencers have worked this out. I would say less than 1%. Oh. Um, the second thing is, instead of getting this affiliate fee, what we what we do is when you um, sell a product from a brand using Caro for the influencer store, um, they because they found the customer and they convinced them to buy and they actually closed the sale in their store, um, they get the retailer cut. They don't get an affiliate fee anymore. They get the retailer's cut. And then the order, because of the way Cairo works, the order is actually transmitted over to the to the supplier. This would be the helmet company, for example. And then they'll ship out the helmet to the customer. And so in this scenario, you're getting the retailer cut, which average, averages around 35%. We're seeing it for anywhere from 20% to 50%, depending on the product category. But in general, it's about 35%. To put this really clearly in perspective, I, I said to my wife one day, um, she she came to me and she was talking about, um, she loves to rescue dogs. And she said, could you help me create an Amazon account to sell dog bowls? Because I want to give the money to to rescue. And and I said to her, you know, but what about using Cairo? Like, why would you use Amazon? I don't understand. And she's like, well, because, you know, that just, that would be really easy. And I and, and I explained to her, but on, on Amazon, you're going to be getting um, like 95 cents per dog bowl. On Caro, you'll get $9.50. And so she's like, well, why didn't you ever explain it like that to me before? Um, and, and so that's that's basically the difference is you own the customer and you get 10 times, somewhere between five to 10 times what you would normally generate um, from a single sale. And so if you're an influencer, that can be absolutely game changing for you. And we have really major influencers like Paris Hilton uses Caro. Um, Ellen DeGeneres uses Caro. Um, so we have we have major people uh, using um, um, our platform. And so from a brand's perspective, what would you rather do? Would you rather pay a very expensive influencer to do one post on Instagram for you? Or would you rather have your products appear in their store and you can enjoy their traffic for free for as long as as you have that relationship. 
That to okay, me. Is- so let's back up a second and make sure that people understand exactly the difference in, in how this process works. So let, let's assume that you're on my, let, we'll just use mine as an example. So buyhappyfeet.com. If I have my Shopify back in and I install the Carol app, which I assume how it works, which I've seen in the past, it allows you to choose those influencers. Tell us once people do that, how the process works, because I think some of the confusion for our listeners might be, well, how does it get on their site and how does it sell on my site and how do people get paid? So maybe walk us through if if I joined and, and put it into Shopify, how I find the people and how the products get out to them if it's all sold on my site. I'm sure they, they'd be curious to understand that flow. Yeah. So let's say you add your slippers to the network. Your slippers then appear in the in the actual catalog for Caro. Um, and we have lots, we have every possible product you can imagine, but your slippers are unique because they're funny and cool and interesting. So they, they would appear in there. Someone who's maybe running, uh, we have influencers that, um, there's, there's a store called Teddy and Bear, beautiful store. Um, and they have really nice things for kids. Maybe we, uh, uh, when they're choosing their future products, they see your slippers and they go, I really like, you know, this one and this one and this one. Then they can just click them. And with a single click, this is the, the crazy part, is it just says add to, to Shopify. And so let's say you're, you're uh, you know, you're, you have your inventory in Shopify. Every time you click one of these things, those slippers will uh, move across into that influencer store in that case. So suddenly you've got, um, you know, uh, all the metadata, the photography, the description, the inventory levels. Everything just moves over with one click. And now uh, the one thing we don't do is we actually don't place the product on the store um, because obviously they want to control how their store looks and they don't want us just randomly slapping products everywhere. So all we do for that one click is place it in your inventory and then in your in your uh, your dashboard, then you can determine where to place the products. Maybe you put them in a collection of slippers or something like that. Um, but you can see how effortless that is. In your case, you've just said, yes, please put my slippers in the catalog. On their side, they they discover the, the slippers and add them to their store. It's that simple. Really interesting. So, okay, so let's back up a second. So someone has a product and they own the brand themselves and they put those, like, let's use the slippers as an example. We set up our Caro account. We list those with Caro. And then anyone out there can come in and say, add it to their site. So if there's XYZ site that's just drop shipping or selling products or using their influence to sell them, they actually put them on their site represented exactly as it is in Shopify, correct? I guess one of the questions they would have is, how do you control pricing and things? How do you control how the sale would go down? Are there any opportunities where people, vendors might see people discount it too far or anything? And maybe I'm getting too far ahead of it, but I'm sure that question would come up in, in control. And then how do you approve those people if, or do they just automatically get to do it? Yeah, we, we have over 28,000 brands have installed Caro now. And um, if I spoke to you about six weeks ago, um, we had about 500,000 products. By the end of the year, we're on track to be around 15 million. Um, so it, it's it's growing very, very quickly. And so you can imagine we're seeing every possible edge case on how people want to do business with each other. Um, and we're just adding the features as we, uh, as we go. Um, but the common way to do it is if you're the one that makes the product, then you, we think if we, we we have the two names, retailer and supplier. If it's your slippers, you're the supplier. And so you get to determine the the the, the MSRP, what, what uh, discounts you're going to allow. You might say, I'll tolerate a 10%, you know, plus or minus on, on the cost of the, the product. If they go outside of that, we actually police them and automatically force it back. So they can't just, uh, they, they can't just go crazy. Um, on the other hand, you are in control of that. Secondly, you determine what split they get because it's your product. It's your decision. How much are you willing to give to retailers? Let's say you're really stingy and you won't give much at all. You're not going to get any partnerships. So it's it's not even something we have to police. It's a self-solving problem. The more generous you are, the more partners you're going to get within the network. And um, and so, you know, you just work out what you think is fair. And, uh, and then... There is the ability to work directly with the brand. So I just want to be crystal clear. When we put two brands together or they discover each other in the platform, we are not any kind of weird agency trying to stop you talking to each other. You can call each other. You can go have lunch together. You can sign contracts together. You can co-market together. You can do anything you like as far as as your relationship goes. 
And um, there's even cases we've had where people have tried selling helmets and then realized they're selling a lot of helmets. So now they're actually going to go make helmets. That's perfectly okay. It's literally, uh, the, the goal is to create a lot of partnerships and a lot of commerce that just didn't exist before. And, uh, and, and you know, by achieving that, um, this becomes an enormous company globally. It's extremely interesting. Now, going back to what I was asking about this, so there are controls in place. You would have to approve the vendor before they could put it up, correct? It's not allowing like anyone to come in because there could be some places where you don't want your product, obviously. But then second of all, you get to, to set up the split and talk with them. So it would be smart probably when you're looking at maybe thinking about some of the influencers, you want to make it fairly aggressive for them so they will work it harder. Is there a balance there? Is there a, a percentage you think people typically should attack? I mean, I, how do people decide what they pay? Um, well, again, once uh, in a lot of cases, um, influencers today, the deals they get are terrible. Um, the, the, the affiliate deals they have are just appalling. And if you talk to the influencers managers, they will tell you, how disappointed they are when they get those royalty reports. They've been sending out certain codes or certain links and they finally get the report back. And they're 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 just about always frustrated because the only way to really check is to fully audit the brand and they really don't want to have to go through full audits. Um, so it's very interesting to them, this concept of, well, hold on, if the influencer owns the store, then every transaction is correct because that's the actual transaction. They sold the product. They know every sale that happened. So it gives them perfect accounting for the first time ever. And uh, and so it's, it's a fundamental change that kind of has to happen if you're serious about being an influencer. Like this is your serious business. Um, you need to own your customers. You need to be able to account for everything. Um, and you need to be able to get the maximum possible each, each time you sell. And so it's up to you to work out a deal. I actually think the influencers don't understand how valuable that real estate is. Let's say you can sell e-bikes really well. To me, that becomes this hallowed ground. I want my e-bike in there. But but if I'm the 50th e-bike company that shows up, I kind of missed it at that point. So um, it's it's going to be an early mover advantage. Can you get your e-bikes into all the influence? You, you should, I know this is going to sound insane, but if I was an e-bike company and there's an influencer I know could really sell my stuff, I'd be like, can I help you get a store set up? Because <laughs> yeah. I, I want to have a deal with you to put my bikes into your traffic all day, every day without having to pay you. Just to be clear, there's no, there's not even a concept in our network of paying the influencer um, to do posts. We don't do that at all. That's not even a concept. It's, yeah, no, I get that. That makes sense. So let me ask this from, let, let's expand on that because it's kind of fascinating, but I think a lot of times you you gave a couple of options of how it's sold. One, you said if they sell it on their site, they get a higher percentage, or if it's a referral, they maybe get a different. Tell us a, that differentiation and how the two, uh, if, if I'm right about those two segments, are those are two segments you can do and how do they differentiate? Um, well, no, there's only there's only technically one way to, to sell it. So when the influencer sells the product, they get the full retailer cut. Um, uh, comparing that to their past, they would get an affiliate fee. Okay, and the yeah. affiliate, so we're we're disrupting affiliates. Uh, that whole concept is okay. We that makes sense. So never accept affiliate fee again of three percent or one percent. Terrible. I was thinking of something slightly different, but said it wrong. So let me ask this. So let's say that XYZ site set up and they're selling the slippers, they get a transaction. How does that flow to the supplier at that point? Because sometimes people may say, I don't want to have a lot of moving parts. I want to make it simple. So once you've agreed to a person, they put it up and they got a transaction. How does it work from that point? Okay. Um, I'll explain that. Um, first of all, one of the most interesting things is that the old paradigm of buying products, storing it at a warehouse, touching it, freight, insurance, all the rest of it, returns, stocking fees, all of that goes away. So all of that margin loss that you, that everyone just accepts in e-commerce is gone because the product only moves when it when it actually um, when it actually sells. So the way the transaction occurs is, let's say um, Paris Hilton sells a Blendjet blender. Um, she accepts the money on her store. So the money's now been accepted. What we then do is behind the scenes, we transfer the wholesale cost from her to the um, to the, the supplier. This would be Blendjet. So they get the wholesale cost plus the shipping um, immediately so that they can then um, uh, send it out. And, and we actually, we, what we do 
is I know the the, the transaction just occurred on on Paris's store, but the actual um, the fulfillment order is automatically generated in Blendjet store. So imagine you're, you're, well, let's go back to your slipper um, example. You wake up in the morning and you have orders in your order queue that you had absolutely nothing to do with. That's what happens here. Somebody else made that sale and the order fell into your order queue for you to, for you to ship out. Um, that- so in essence, if I had one slipper, let's say it's a blue and white sold on one influencer site or, or on the other sites, I wake up in the morning, I see that order for the blue and white sitting there like it's a normal order and the money is transferred from the wholesale thing. There's yep. no other moving parts. Then it flows into ship station or whatever it is, and it gets out to the customer. Very simple, correct? Exactly. And it does transfer all the tracking and everything. So there's no other maintenance needed, correct? Yep. Uh, it's all really done. fantastic. It, it, it unwinds, returns correctly. The returns come back to the supplier, so the, the the slippers would come back to you, and the whole thing gets unwound correctly. Um, That's so interesting. So, from a supplier standpoint, let's say that we have people out there, vendors like this sounds great, but you know who knows the people they have on there. Tell us about the people that that you have that are the influencer or, or sites that will sell, you know, in that program, and how maybe you vet them. How, how do how do the the people that are going to come in and work with you know that these people are going to be able to produce it, and and how do you find them? Well, what we do, um, we we basically. Uh, first of all, we gate out everything that's negative. So there's no there's no firearms or drugs or anything like that. Um, and then what we do is we um, we had a really interesting uh, question is, should we filter brands based on sales? And we actually tried that for a while, um, but we realized that we're, we're, we're killing out the people who are new to e-commerce and are really serious about investing into it and, and really going for it. Um, because they didn't meet a minimum threshold, we didn't let them into Caro. Um, we've changed that policy now to allow people to come in and actually, uh, uh, and you know, sort of test out the platform and show who they are. Um, but we we are very very cautious about um, anybody that's 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 uh, not delivering. They're immediately ejected from the platform, and it's much more punishing than it sounds. Um, if you get ejected from Caro, you're going to lose your relationship with all these brands um, forever, and that's a terrible terrible situation to be in um, because it can become so material to your business. There's lots of people who've doubled their sales um, on our platform. And so to, to sort of lose that and all those relationships, it's going to, I think over time, we're going to end up with a reputation system like Airbnb within the platform. And we'll present that to you. Uh, we're sort of working on it behind the scenes, but um, at some point we'll present it to you and say, you know, here's your rating and here's how you're doing. And it will become life and death to make sure that you're a high quality entity shipping on time and handling everything correctly. And and there's no platform like this that 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 could work without that kind of reputation system. Right. So walk me through. Let's say that uh, I assume that your normal percentages. Let's assume you're talking about fifty percent that is uh, an uh, uh, influencer or whoever is putting out their store. What's the average percentage you think if it's wholesale that the that the seller keeps versus the the supplier? It's around, the seller usually gets around thirty five percent. Okay, so thirty five percent. Let's base it on a thirty dollar transaction. That's nine dollars so less ten fifty. So typically you get the 1950 wholesale plus the shipping put into your system and people have to figure their margins based on something like that, but they're not paying an upfront fee to that person that's putting it out, nor any kind of implementation fees or any kind of maintenance. So that's that as simple as it gets right there. That's as simple as it gets. Yeah. That's really amazing. So let me ask you this. I'm sure that you've had some people in for a while that have worked in the system or you have a you, some of your clients that you think have really optimized this. How many, I, I envision a few, maybe 10, 12, 50 people that you work with. Is it is it a small number that people typically work with or do they end up working with hundreds because of the recommendation system? Does it Is it e- as easy to work with 100 as it is 10 or 15? Well, I'll give you a good example. Go to gear.com. Um, if you go to gear.com and click on brands, and then you click on all brands, you see an incredible selection of partnerships that this uh, that this company has, and they can have they there you know you can do wholesale, you can make your own products, and then you can just form partnerships with Caro. So to be clear, it's completely flexible. It's not you know you're only allowed to do it one way. You can do it any way that works best for your company. But what this means is a company like like gear.com can try products and learn about products and see what works 
and uh, and and you know very carefully curate the partnerships that they want. Um, it, they can try a new product category if they wanted to try kayaks, for example. You really want to be buying a, a, a you know pallets of kayaks to see if you can sell them, or do you just want to add them and see what happens? And uh, and you know now you've got no risk at all. There's no capital outlay. If you start selling kayaks, do you want to try foldable kayaks? Because we have those too. And you can try those in your store. And you can see how you can intelligently build a very, very strong marketplace by working out what your audience really wants. And again, at no capital cost. The second thing that we see a lot in e-commerce is it's a bit like reruns on TV. It gets boring over time. And, and people build an e-commerce store and they don't keep it updated. They don't keep it fresh. Like you go back six months later, it's the same as it was six months ago. So that's something else you can do with Caro. Let's say it's Valentine's Day or the 4th of July or Halloween, and you want to add products that sort of are fun or it's yoga day, and you want to add products for that. You can do that with at zero cost. You literally just add the products, do a marketing thing, do press releases, whatever you want to do, um, enjoy the extra sales, and then, and then just remove that stuff because it, it didn't cost you anything. So just remove it. It's like, it's not the 4th of July anymore. Move on. And so pop-up stores, um, pop-up relationship stores, partnerships with influencers would be a good example. Like today is, is whatever day with, with a certain influencer that you like, you can add their stuff to the store instantly. Um, and so that, that flexibility to make the merchandising stay alive in your store, I think is really important. I'll give you one really cool tip is uh, if you've played, have you played with chat GPT um, yet? You know, the whole yes. AI, everyone's going crazy. Yeah. So just go on to chat GPT and type in, I own an online bike store. What are all the products I should sell to get the maximum possible revenue? Simple as that. Chat GPT will immediately give you the shopping list of things that you should be selling to get the maximum possible revenue out of an online bike store. And it's fascinating. And so you should try it as well for yours, you know, um, and, and see what, what it comes up with because the AI has got a very, very clear sort of view on, on these are all the kind of things you should think about. And you can, you can steer it a little bit, but ultimately, or you can tell it what you currently sell. Here are the items that I currently have in my online store and just give a list of all the items you sell. Um, what other items, complementary items, could I sell that would increase my sales? And it will just give you a to-do list. Then you come over to Caro and just add those products to your store. That's absolutely amazing. So what kind of reach do you think some of the people that would come in and do these stores? I mean, is, is it some people that don't have any reach? Do they need to have a certain amount to be successful? Is there sort of a wheelhouse size of a following that someone needs or, or a scope? Or is it just if you want to start an e-commerce store and you feel like you're going to push it, here it is? Yeah, I mean, uh, um, the truth in, in e-commerce is is um, that a lot of people don't know how to get attention, and it's it culls the herd very quickly. So a lot of people start a store, they put all their effort in, they set it all up, and then they just don't know how to get people to come to it. And so that's why we thought this was important as a concept is to help you get your products into other people's traffic and and, and uh, you know get awareness that way. The more people that see your products, the better. I'd highly recommend being very generous with retailers and get as many eyeballs looking at your stuff. There's no risk to you. They just are gonna are gonna basically buy the product and the order comes back to you. So it's it's a win. Um and, and ultimately that's the hard part is really getting these uh online brands going. And, and you see a lot of uh, a lot of people get culled because they just never work it out. They find that it's costing them a hundred dollars to sell a thirty dollar item and they just can't make it work. Um, and and they're not all experts in in SEO and and buying traffic and partnerships. That's the one thing I say to brands is is how much does it cost for us to put our products together? Like put the bike on the and the helmet by each other at sunset on the beach or whatever. How much does that cost to take that picture and get it into our social media? Um, it's you know it's really next to nothing. And 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 uh and and showing that you're working with other cool brands just gives you things um, to post. Um, a good example, I think, is a company called Blendjet. They make these portable blenders, and they didn't sell what went in the blender um, because of all the perishable goods that that would entail. That you know, do they, do they want to sell frozen items? Not really. Um, they're an electronics company, but by working with Caro, they could have an unlimited amount of products. They have a marketplace now, and if you go look through the marketplace, they have some great brands like Oatly working with them. 
um, and that's powered by Caro. And they're able to now sell subscriptions to the to the, to the things that go in their blenders, um, which is super cool uh, use of of this concept. It's really incredible. Now, I think unfortunately for a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, let's say that they're out there and they built a brand and they're ready to take care of and take it wider. Let's just say they made that decision. They want to list their products with you. You know, a lot of a lot of times, I think even for me as an entrepreneur, I go to what's the worst case? How am I going to get screwed on this? How am I going to look bad? What is the downside to this? Because everyone wants to protect that because your brand and the reputation are so important. So tell me how people have dealt with, because obviously there's some customer service issues that they're going to have to deal with. So they may not know the answers you want, or if they don't treat the customer right, it could reflect on your brand originally. Are there anything that you've seen that people need to be concerned about when they're working with these marketplaces or influencers, as we would call it, are, are there concerns there from um, a standpoint of customer service and pricing and how they represent the brand? Or, or is that something that you usually don't need to worry about because the people are controlled and come in and apply in your business? No, it's uh, it's it's uh, it's up to you to determine, again, the relationship. I, I think it makes sense to talk to the people you're going to partner with. I would. So if it was my brand, I would call the company and talk to the CEO and have a chat and say, we're going to work together. Let's do this thing. Um, and, uh, you know, this should be a really healthy relationship. So I think ha having communication with the brands is probably a good move. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, if somebody isn't performing like six months from now, you're not happy with someone, you can literally just hit a button and eject them. So, um, you know, the relationship's over. I'm done with it. We're breaking up. Um, that's okay too. Um, so, you, you know, you have your own expectations. I would have your team learn about the product. So if you're selling, so imagine you're the seller, then you should at least, your team should at least be taking the time to learn about the products that you're selling. Um, it, you know, it's easy to add them with Caro. It's maybe too easy to add them with Caro. So at some point you actually, you want to make sure they're aware of it because then they're, when they're doing, um, they're doing events or anything, they should always be thinking about what they can do with the partner products as well. Cause that's all extra sales. And, and honestly, it's, you know, as you get a higher AOV that determines how much you can spend to buy customers. And so everything that can get you a higher AOV is super interesting. And you got to make sure your whole team's on that page. Like we're all in this, we all understand why we're doing this. Right. And this is, this is the objective is to increase the AOV. Um, and, and when you increase the AOV, that increases the lifetime value as well, um, which ultimately is how much you can spend um, to, to find a customer. Now, clearly there, you know, there are, everything's not a success story, but sometimes I think, you know, people want to understand how can I best use my resources if I come in and work with Carol? So let me give you an example. Like with the slipper thing, we keep going back to that. A couple of years ago, we made some very targeted designs that were like for teacher profession and medical profession, you know, around that for doctors and nurses and things like that. Is it better to have products that are really targeted to a demographic? Cause then you're getting, you know, way closer to what that person's selling. Because I envision this huge eBay store, someone would sell, you know, dice and maybe books and all kinds of stuff and how do products get lost? Is it better to have things that are targeted to that brand, that kind of site? Does that make it more successful? Yeah, yeah, you still want to curate very carefully um, everything that would make sense or uh, in this case, let's say it's your slipper store, you really want to curate that store carefully to make sure it really still is a cohesive brand, unless you decide to go big. And if you go big, then you become a marketplace. And so your slippers are just one piece of your overall, you know, shoes. And now you're starting to cover every possible kind of shoes. And then you start going, well, do we add the socks? Well, why wouldn't you? That increases your AOV. Of course you should. And so you start becoming a full marketplace. So that's a maturity thing. Do you decide that you are the, the funny slipper brand, which I think is actually a great uh, opportunity because there's a lot of, um, my goodness, gifting companies. We do Santa.com. We power Santa.com. I wish we had have had your slippers in Santa.com in Q4. That would have been phenomenal. Um, so there's just... You can see how there's just so much opportunity that didn't exist because the technology didn't exist to make this easy for everybody. Um, but that's something we're building in earnest on a day by day basis. And whenever we hear from the brands what is necessary, um, you know, we add those features immediately. 
It's really amazing. I mean, I agree with you, too. It's, it's something, obviously, I want to look into more. And I think it's sort of a way, you know, I've talked to some people that we look at all kinds of different marketing with influencers, whether it's paid or like your business, where you sort of invest in them having a store. I really like this idea. But let me, you know, it, it, does it really matter who's doing it? Because I started talking about this. Let me give you another hypothetical. We had a teacher driven slipper. I mean, do teachers are they good people to throw up a little Shopify store that they can raise money for their classroom and be able to buy things and say it's a targeted teacher thing? Is, is this an opportunity for people to gain revenue that even if they're doing some other job by utilizing their captured group, say their classroom, who has to buy gifts or buy something and they encourage them to buy there and it helps them do that? Is, is that a process that people look at if they're if they're looking at a marketplace? Well, I'm super biased, but I think it's the best possible way because you're working with real brands. Um, you're not working, you're not drop shipping from China, right? This is, these are real brands and you can build, we've actually, we, we uh, had, had a company that was adding uh, um, food and they were, they were selling cookies and things like that, but they ended up getting acquired. And it's just interesting to see because they become a bigger entity than they were before, because now they have a full marketplace and their sales are going crazy. So um, there is an opportunity, but there's an opportunity to build something quite exciting. There's a brand um, consumer house um, that was built by a girl uh, or a lady called uh, Claire Spackman. Um, and she ended up um, adding 150 different um, partnerships and 800 products into a marketplace. And she, uh, she they ended up writing about her on Forbes. And so the ability for one individual, can you imagine trying to do 150 partnerships the old way? Um, and ha and then having 800 products showing up at your warehouse with your hard hat on when the granola pallets are arriving, she didn't have to do any of that. She just chose the products she wanted, and she and she took her store live. And then she started to work with influencers to drive traffic um, to her store. So absolutely, any teacher could do it. Um, a, an example we 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 had uh, recently is uh, um, is a pickleball is becoming quite a big um, thing, and. There's a group called The Kitchen, which is 350,000 pickleball players. It's the largest community. They wanted a marketplace. So what do you do? Do you get a warehouse and start buying multi-thousand dollar nets and paddles that are going to be old a month from now? Or do you just build the whole thing on Caro and then you can add all the products, all the paddles, all the nets, all the stuff, have a great big marketplace and uh, and take it live immediately. And uh, and that that's why we think this is important because there's so many communities in the world. There's so many groups of people, Facebook oh. groups, you're right, teachers, uh, people trying to save or rescue pets, whatever it is, you can, you can build a marketplace on Cairo. It is really incredible when, you know, obviously at Quite Light, we, we're an M&A company, but we try to be very actionable in e-com and teach people. You know, I think we we probably do more of that than we do about anything. But when you talk about an M&A purpose, when you're looking to exit your business, having that larger scope of people out there really can help it. Now, it, it changes the margin some. So there are some things that obviously people have to be concerned about. One other question I have, who owns the customer record? That's kind of an interesting thought here because you have a couple of systems you're working in and both will have that information that's redacted from the, the actual su supplier versus the marketplace person. Who ends up owning that and can go back to that client? That's a great question. So um, it, it was interesting because we assumed that it would be the retailer would own the customer and that's the way we created the system. So it's the retailer made the sale, so it's their customer. Right. Period. Um, but. What we what we found is that in our in when you when you look at the page, it'll say fulfilled by our friends at and then the name of the brand. So fulfilled that are by our friends at uh, Blendjet, for example. Um, and that um, we found that very commonly the two companies that we've put together have absolutely no competitive bones in their body. They're not even close. Like one is making milk and the other is making electronics. So. Are they willing to share uh, information? And that's actually something they can turn on. So um, why would you ever um, do that? Well, the answer is, is because the value to the supplier is incredibly high if they can grow a customer too. So yeah. if you're if you're the slipper company and an influencer sells the shoe, but you're not competing with the influencer and they and they they go ahead and let you share the customer, you just increase the customer. So you got up this morning to an order in your order queue and a customer. How much does the customer normally cost you? Like thirty bucks or twenty bucks or something? That's that's uh, that's a that's a really exciting thing um, in relationships to get. So what what that does is that makes you want to be more generous with your retailers. So if you get a 
you see how that matters, right? If if you're if you get the customer, then you know what I'm going to be more generous with this this retailer. So I want to be clear: there is no set rule here. This is up to them to work this out. That we had expected it would just be the retailer only, but we do have cases in the network where they feel a true partnership. They're not competing at all, and they're perfectly okay with sharing customers. That makes total sense. So I think the relationship has to be great between the two because he's basically representing your product and you want to make sure that that happens as well. So so tell us a little bit about Caro and how they make money on this. I mean, is it contained in the transaction? How do you all work with your clients, you know, uh, from a financial standpoint? Well, first of all, it's, uh, it's free to put your products into the network. So uh, we will help uh, you get sales for your products just by joining Caro. Um, but what we what we did is we created uh, um, subscriptions, which are for the retailers. And the subscriptions are based on two things is how much help do you want? Because if you want, we'll actually get on the phone with you and really brainstorm. We have merchandising experts who will brainstorm with you to help you. So you can do it yourself. So it is self-service. But if you choose, you can pay more and actually um, and get help. Um, but it's it's low, like the 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 the, the, the bottom tier is like thirty five dollars a month. 75 and then i think uh we're up at like 250 or something like that it's not it's not crazy um and then the um the second feature is the more partnerships you have sort of forces you up the tiers so we don't want you coming in and spamming everyone in our network and trying to get 500 different deals and then paying us 35 dollars for it um so what we do want to do like imagine you build your whole marketplace on us for for 35 dollars it uh, that wouldn't be good. So just to be clear, the the more partnerships, then we push you up the the tiers, and that just makes sense. Then uh, as far as transactions go, um, we charge five percent for the actual transactions, um, and that that effectively comes off the top. Which means, and just to, to how we pitch this is very simple. Which is this is a whole new revenue stream for you. This is keep doing everything you're doing today. But we're gonna we're gonna get you more sales, and those additional sales are gonna cost five percent, and you're splitting that between you and the supplier. So ultimately, you can argue you're you're really just paying two and a half percent for an entirely new revenue revenue line that never existed before, and that's uh, that's a pretty easy pitch. So if you're giving the supplier thirty five, you're having another two and a half if you have a transaction from their side. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Thirty seven and a half is what it ends up if you negotiate. Assuming thirty five is is a, is a monthly subscription in dollars, so it's just thirty five dollars. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Now let me let me ask this. So how does licensing help or hurt this? Let's say that someone has a college license or a Disney license, are there people out there? Does that make it easier to target people that can be successful as well as sites that may want to add that? Or or is it just, it really doesn't matter. Your products are going to be your products. Are there people out there looking for those specific types of licenses? Yeah, there's actually, um, there's uh, a very interesting, we, we have, we have three categories of products and I think we're finding a fourth. So one is, um, uh, core products. So the core stuff that you would expect to be on our network. The second is impulse buy. We actually power television shows like the Today Show on NBC. Um, uh, Also, Univisions uh, does live selling on television. We power that as well. And so the idea of those guys is they want stuff that will convert instantly. When someone sees it, they have to buy it. And it has to be high margin. So so it's a really... um, they can give a big discount. So here's this thing that I see and I want, and it's a really big discount. That's an impulse byproduct. We can never have enough of those. Um, the third category, so we have core, we have impulse buy. The third is super high-end brands. So we have Balenciaga, um, you know, all the all the, the sort of Adidas and Nike and, and Canon and all of these companies. Um, that's our, our high-end um, piece of the puzzle. And we're ingesting millions of those products actually right the second. Um, so that's a very exciting um, other piece. But that last uh, that that last and sort of fourth piece of the puzzle is what I'm considering to be white label. And what it really means is you you uh, like, for example, say you wanted to partner with the people who did Stranger Things and you want to make Stranger Things um, shoes or slippers, then are you willing to do that? Or if you're like we Super 73 is an incredible e-bike company in our network. Is there some partnership? that you you can do together where you're going to get a lot of sales for them, but you're going to end up, um, you know, um, doing a different 
vinyls on the bike that will actually increase the the sales. So it's some kind of licensing deal. Um, and we see we see enormous opportunity for that, which is uh, customizing things. We have people doing it today, like Barstool Sports does that with us. So if you buy a mug, it's actually being sent from a partner um, who puts Barstool Sports on it and sends it. Um, and so the idea of um, of of that category of people that want um, you know customized stuff, but at zero effort for them, like just I want this, but will you please add um, our logo or or our our art to it? Um, I think there's an incredible amount of opportunity there as well. It's really amazing because you're right about it. if people make you know. Uh, like I have a, I have a custom printer that we can do stuff on as well. So t-shirts, things like that, you know, ASI products, things like that. If you can really push it, there are a lot of opportunities there. It's really interesting because the more you talk about it, the more the scope gets bigger. So I think that's, what's really exciting about your business and, you know, how it can help entrepreneurs. Um, I guess I wanted to sort of wrap it up. Are there things that we haven't covered you'd want the listeners to know about Get Caro and and or have we pretty much talked about everything and they just have to come in and see the excitement of it? Yeah, I think I think the thing is that it, you, should, you should definitely take the time to at least consider this. I, I just bought my my wife an e-bike on the weekend. We went into a local store and I was standing in the store looking and the guy had thousand helmets on the wall. And I, I was like, oh, thousands part of our network. And and as I looked around at the things he was selling, we asked him, can we buy one of these? And he's like, oh, I don't I don't have any of those in stock. And then can we buy one of those? Do you have this in that color? No, I don't have that. And I, I just was like, this is this is crazy. I'm standing in a retail store. He has a Shopify store, but he hasn't used Caro. So therefore, he doesn't he can have every helmet in every color and every size and every other bike component always available. Um, and he can just say, like, I don't have this here, but if you go on our website, um, we have it right now um, and I can have that delivered to you. Um, it, it, it's fundamentally changes those kind of things. So I, I think um, now that you understand what we're doing, I think you'll have all kinds of ideas on what you could do with that. And, and we're welcome. We'd love to have those conversations. So please do feel free to reach out to us. The email address is hello at getcaro.com. Our website is getcaro.com. And please mention this podcast because they will they will give you VIP treatment um, if you mention this podcast. David, man, it's been amazing having you in today. I think I like, uh, you know, teasing them, letting people reach out. You know, I know you can get this in the Shopify app store. People should really take a look at this because it's very progressive. And it's interesting how, you know, small TikTok influencers and other people out there are having real success getting engagement. And some people, this may be an easy way to find people that can, you know, really hit some stores. I, I actually am thinking of some people that have a chance to do some really good stuff with this. So I, I'd love to follow up with you sometime. Maybe we can do a demo and then maybe follow it up. But I appreciate you being in here today, David. Sounds great. Thanks so much.